Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. Today, January 26th, 2023, we are excited to present Ukraine's National Bar, Reform, Renewal, and Independence. My name is Jack Apizi, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. George Bogdan and Dr. Valentin Gvozdi, who is joining us today from Kiev. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you do have a question at any time during the program, please type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle them as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, thank you all for being with us. George, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, as Jack mentioned, I'm a member of the Federalist Society and a Kennan Fellow at the Kennan Institute. I'm just delighted to, to be here today, and I'd like to thank the International and National Security Law Practice Group for hosting this event. I have the pleasure of interviewing my good friend, Dr. Valentin Gvozdi, uh, Vice President of the Ukrainian National Bar this morning, regarding a topic we think will be of interest to the members, and um, that's the development of Ukraine's National Bar. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to give everyone a little bit of uh, information about Valentin. Uh, he's a managing partner at Go Law and an attorney at law. Uh, his areas of expertise are focused on litigation and dispute resolution, bankruptcy, debt restructuring, as well as working with non-performing loans. Valentin has also been serving as vice president of the Council of Europe's Committee on Experts on the Protection of Lawyers since April of last year. In 2019, uh, Valentin was elected as the head of the supervisory board for Euchre Hydro Energy. Um, in 2017, Valentin was awarded the title of Honored Lawyer of Ukraine, and he has also obtained a Doctor of Philosophy in Administrative Law and Process, Financial Law, and Informational Law, before completing special programs in corporate governance um, at Harvard Business School. Uh, so I'd like to um, thank everyone for joining us. I think we're going to jump right in in the hope that we have time for uh, open Q&A at the end. Uh, just to be totally transparent, I'm going to be noting down questions as they come in um, and presenting them to Valentin once we uh, finish our initial uh, set of questions. Uh, so let me let me see here. I think what I'll start with, uh, Valentin, is if you could tell us a little bit about what practicing law in Ukraine was like before it became independent um, and what uh, role professional organizations played in that system. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, George. First, I would like to thank the Federalist Society for this invitation to discuss the National Bar's many successes in recent years. It means a great deal to be joining this uh, venerable organization for this kind of exchange, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. President Reagan said, freedom is a fragile thing, and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation. I think this quote captures the essence of the story behind Ukrainian National Bar Association. We are living evidence of the realities of President Reagan's insights, actually. So to get to your question, I would say that Ukraine has been on the path towards greater reform for many years. The prior system created by Soviet Union was characterized by inaccessibility, actually. There was a lack of availability of legal resource for people who needed it. It was a legal system that, because of the centrally planned economy, was largely an administrative system with tens of thousands of internal regulations, many of which were not published. Even when they were published, they are done so in a limited fashion and are not generally available. For example, lawyers could make a list of laws relevant to a case by referring to legislation that uh, pertain to it. It could take a year to find the text of less than majority of them. It was an undoubtedly frustrating experience just to gain access to rules that were certainly relevant to clients and any foreign investment businessman who would be involved in commercial transactions in the former USSR. So that is where things began, actually. We are coming from the, that context. 30 years is actually a short period to jump from such a system to radical transparency. Professional organizations in USSR echoed the realities of the legal system in general. They were controlled by state, riven with mistrust, and often acted arbitrarily. 
To the extent they thought to help litigants, they made it harder for them to hold their advocates accountable in instances in which they underperformed. However, in some satellite republics like Ukraine, the bar hardened in the times of confrontation with the totalitarian regime. The struggle peaked in the late 80s as a, reason, uh, as a response against pressure of the state of the bar. That's where we began. That's fascinating, Valentin. Um, I guess I have to ask now, you know, would you tell us a little bit about the evolution that took place that got us where we are today? Of course, of course, since 1991, the bar went through the three major stages. And each new stage was actually marked by amendments to uh, pertinent uh, legislation and the constitution. Fortunately, every time the bar succeeded in gaining more and more independence and those brought us closer to European standards of the legal profession. In 1992, the first post-Soviet law, uh, the name of this law was just Law on the Bar, ensured transition of the bar from being under complete control of the state towards quasi, so-called quasi self-governance. Only 20 years later, on July 5, 2012, our parliament adopted the law of Ukraine on the bar at practice of law. This law provided for incorporation of the first independent professional organization of advocates, Ukrainian National Bar Association, with a single membership. Those Ukrainian bar now have to operate under the model of true self-governance. And just for your information, today we have more than 70,000 members in our organization. This is huge, a large organization and quite impressive number. The Bar of Ukraine is grateful to the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which adopted resolution back in 1995, recommending Ukraine as a state to establish an independent professional organization of lawyers, which later became one of the conditions, actually, for the subsequent conclusion of the European Union and Ukraine Association Agreement. And it's difficult to say, and uh, actually... Um, uh, uh, it's hard to understand that it took 17 years to implement this parliamentary assembly resolution in uh, in relation to the bar. Right. And so I want to dig a little bit deeper on that last point that you made, um, because it's it's difficult for those of us outside of, of the country and, and not part of the system uh, to understand what prompted the reform that really brought the bar to where it is today, which is this kind of, um, ex as you've mentioned, a kind of model um, in some ways. So would you tell us a little bit about that final step? Well, you know, George, it's an interesting story. Ukraine is currently the EU member candidate and uh, party to the EU Eastern Partnership Foreign Policy Initiative, cooperating with EU on the basis of the 2014 Association Agreement. This in agreement, in terms of its scope, is the largest international legal document in the history of Ukraine and also largest international agreement with a third party over concluded by the European Union. These are great milestones for the foreign policy of our country, but the achievements require time. And of course, most importantly, the persistent efforts of politicians, diplomats, and of course, our advocates. In short, the bar emerged as a part of the process to reform required to join the EU. The success of the bar, we might say, it, is an example of lawyers paving the way for independence of their professional community. Thanks. Um, I want to push you a little bit on this point because I noticed that the that the law on the bar was passed when Viktor Yanukovych was president of Ukraine, and I want to ask you know, how did that happen? I'm asking specifically because he doesn't have the best uh, reputation in America. Uh, I'm recalling when when we saw headlines about the ostriches in his private zoo uh, and the solid gold faucets on his estate when he was overthrown. And I just wonder if you can walk us through how that uh, coincidence of, of timing took place. <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's complicated, but at the same time, funny question, yeah? Because uh, former Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych is not only not 
popular in Ukraine. <laughs> he is the worst person we can imagine in our uh, recent political history. And he mm, was pro-Russian president. And uh, of course, um, it, it reminds me of that <laughs> another quote by American Revolutionary War General, William Prescott, who said, uh, emphatically, actually, an obstacle is often a stepping stone. With regard to the Ukrainian war in Ukraine, I think that that turned out to be the case, actually. Yanukovych was, of course, a president who did not prioritize the rule of law at all, let's say. However, he was stuck with a pre-existing legal on-ramp to the EU, and he had no choice. Yanukovych and his advisors had to decide what to do as deadlines approached. Actually, the government of Ukraine had to show some progress. To do so, one year, one year, they just chose to reform the National Bar Association. They decided it's not a big deal for them. But for National Bar Association, it was a huge milestone and great chance. That is how the process got rolling. It was a somewhat unexpected change, but an important one. In cooperation, in cooperation of the National Bar Association satisfied one of the preconditions for the future conclusion of the association agreement, namely establishment of, of a professional bar association uh, and protecting the status of the legal profession by law, actually. Okay. Well, that, that fills out the picture, I think, on that, that interesting side of the story. Um, so now let's dig in a little bit to the question of how radical the change was that took place, because we have a picture of what, what happened before. We have kind of the stages in our mind, and we know the political realities that brought it to bear. So would you describe a little bit, you know, how, how radical that change was, what a departure in terms of, of that took place? Yeah, it was quite radical. The current law on the bar departed actually from old concept completely. The powers of the bar are not delegated by state anymore as in preceding years. Instead, bar association derives the power directly from the constitution and the special law regulated its activity. Uh, for example, such as self-governance was imposed, uh, managing access to the legal profession, we do it by ourselves, we resolve issues of disciplinary reliability of lawyers, we are uh, maintaining and keeping the unified register of advocates of Ukraine, etc. In addition uh, to the core law on the profession, the rules and regulation regarding the bar are set by advocates themselves also. Uh, this includes very important document, rules of professional conduct, um, also admission requirements. Also, uh, we issue the clarification of the law about bar and practice of law. It is fundamentally different from the preceding stage uh, of the bar development between 1992 and 2012. Of course, it's quite different. It's completely new model. Interesting. And so who would you say were the primary parties responsible uh, for the reform process? Well, George, first, let's talk about the broad, stro <clears throat> about the broad strokes or the, or, or the highest level, let's say. The 2012 law of Ukraine on the bar and practice of law was implementing uh, the recommendations of both the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and also the Nice Commission. The Nice Commission is a special body in the Council of Europe, which was created specially to promote democracy through the law, through the rule of law. And this Venice Commission works like an expert body. They review the documents, they review the draft of the law, and after that, they give their position. If they, are, they, if they, are they okay with this law, or they have some maybe thoughts different from the text. Those bodies took into account the best European practices of bar organization and European standards, actually, of the self, uh, of, of bar self-government. They recommended 
that uh, the Ukrainian National Bar Association became the first and only all Ukrainian professional organization with mandatory membership for all advocates in Ukraine. Here, I just want to make very small remark uh, for our American colleagues. Uh, it's important to understand that in Europe, we have completely different model of organization of the bar. It's very different from American one. I would not say it's better or it's not good. Um, it's just different. And uh, in Ukraine, we have uh, this structure where prosecutors, they just work for the state. They are not members of any bar. They just prosecutors. It's a separate profession. Judges also are completely independent and they are state servants, but they independently act in as a third power in the country. And advocates, national bar associations, acting completely separately as independent bodies protected hu protecting human rights, protecting people, providing legal support to everyone who need it. Uh, that's that's important clarification. That's why we need this mandatory membership because in Ukraine and many, many other European countries, we have exclusive right to represent people in the court. So only member of the bar can represent people in the court and these people, th these advocates will be under the mm, power of the special legislation, regulation, including code of conduct. Uh, also, we also have to talk uh, about what Ukraine Parliament actually did. Uh, they accomplished a truly landmark contribution to the development of Ukraine as a state governed by law. This important achievement actually turns the constitutional rights and freedoms of citizens into a real opportunities and provides a mechanism for their protection, primarily from the encroachment uh, by state, adoption of key European standards of advocacy, independence, and self-governance into the national law paved the way towards integration of Ukrainian national bar with the European professional community. The new system of representation and management assumes that only advocates actually participate therein. Advocates themselves establish the rules of their institutional functioning and enjoy legal guarantees and protection against interference of state authorities. It, it was not always like this. This actually, we have this situation only after 2012 when we actually received a brand new law, which was European integration law, as I mentioned before. Right. And so this, I think, brings me to my next question, which is a bit about the nitty gritty. And I'd like to know, and I think our, our members would be interested in knowing what uh, Ukrainian lawyers on the ground uh, did to advance this process. Oh, actually, uh, it's true. The burden of practical implementation of those recommendations of Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe was completely on our shoulders. We created, we have created the new bar from scratch, actually, mm -hmm. actually, fulfilling not only the requirements of the law, but also Ukrainians' international obligations. We made every effort to develop it as we understood that self-government of the profession on the basis of the European, of the best European practices, guarantees, advocates the independence and high level of professional standards. Advocate self-government is currently developed as a balanced system of national scale where strong regional bodies are kept in check by the national body. A democratic nature of the system requires that all offices within the advocate self-government are elective and bear term limits. This is very important. The advocate's exclusive audience right, <clears throat> right means that Ukrainian bar enjoys the same status in the judicial uh, justice system as in other European countries. At the same time, Ukraine is far ahead of many Eastern European countries and also countries from post-Soviet uh, countries in terms of this uh, reform, actually. This innovation introduced by the recent changes to the constitution aimed pr primarily uh, at effective protection of citizens' rights and interests, of course. Uh, 
But to our dismay, we, we now observe attempts to reverse it in some ways. But it's not a topic of today's conversation. Uh, we can uh, talk about this maybe next time. Right. I guess, you know, what I would like to know is, you know, everyone's cognizant of the present circumstances in Ukraine and, and, and our heart goes out to those who are fighting on behalf of uh, their country. And I, I ask, you know, during this period of, of uh, war fighting, what is being done to ensure the longevity of this institution, the one we've been discussing? Yeah, the war effort is primarily aimed at ensuring the future of Ukraine's independence, of course. It is institutions like the bar that are at stake. They, they would, with a, and absolutely, that, that's for sure, disappear under Russian rule. So for, for the time being, the recommendations of the Council of Europe and the United Nations basic principles on the role of lawyers stipulate that all legislation regulating the bar as institution cannot be amended without notice and consultations with the professional organization. Unfortunately, these principles are not always followed in Ukraine, and some legislative amendments are accepted without constitution, uh, without consultations with UNBA. It actually was before, more before than now. Now, situation is a little bit better, but still, the current law on the bar implements the European standards by providing for ability for foreign lawyers. Uh, to practice in Ukraine. It's new. And uh, since 2012, the national legislation allowed for uh, the in in integration of professional lawyers from different states into Ukrainian bar. Actually. The purpose of such novelty was to create an opportunity for foreign investors to seek legal advice in Ukraine, not only from local lawyers, but also from, from lawyers of their own state. In strategic Sense. It was meant to stimulate foreign business to start projects in Ukraine, as such businesses were granted improved opportunities for legal defense. The bar uh, is currently the most stable institution within the uh, justice system in Ukraine. That's also very important to, to know. Very interesting. And I, I really appreciate your bringing up that, that recent change. Um, and, and, and placing it for our listeners in the strategic terms that I think it was conceived. And that kind of brings me to my, my, my next question, which really pertains to the leadership strategic objectives of the bar as a, as a member of the, the leadership. How do you conceive of those? All these years we have been working uh, person to the same addition of the core law. This allowed us to accomplish the below strategic objectives, to build a self-governing independent professional advocacy organization with a single compulsory membership, which is really strong and big deal, to ensure the unimpeded exercise of legal practice following the principles of the rule of law, legality, independence, confidentiality, and the avoidance of conflict of interest, of course, to establish a list of professional rights and guarantees, real guarantees that allow defenders to work safely, professionally, and effectively. The fact that this law has, <clears throat> has not undergone fundamental changes since 2012, despite a serious risk of politically motivated amendments, uh, proves an important rule. The stability of legislation is a decisive factor, actually, in the development of effective institutions. The law on the bar enabled creation of a stable institution at national and regional level. Uh, executive bodies, bar councils, qualification and disciplinary commissions of the bar and higher bodies on the national level, Bar Council of Ukraine and High Qualification of Different Commission of the Bar of Ukraine. A few years ago, before the outbreak of the war, the Bar Council of Ukraine approved uh, our UNBA 2025 strategy, which defines priority development objectives and actions for the next four years. Also, our President Zelensky before the war, adopted a strategy 
about development of the judiciary and constitutional justice in Ukraine till 2023. Maybe this document, it's not um, relevant anymore because of war, because of what happened actually, but Ukrainian National Bar Association worked closely um, just to follow the vision how our judiciary in Ukraine should be reformed. And of course, we prepared a package of proposals to this action plan, a sufficiently specific, professional. This is a roadmap that it is that is coordinated, agreed, and should be finalized and implemented in the coming years, despite of the war. Very interesting uh, to see that your ambitions for making the making the bar better are continuing despite circumstances. Um, in that regard, I'd like to ask a little bit about the principle of self-government, which would, seems to be central to this a change that took place. And I'd like to ask whether that's taking root in the sense that traditions of the past are changing or a new generation of lawyers might uh, be celebrating that idea in new ways. How would you comment on that? Yes, absolutely. In our case, the principle of self-governance uh, provides that the audit powers regarding the bar self-government uh, carried out by the bar bodies. All of the all of them are elected by advocates from among practicing advocates, seasoned professional, trusted by professional communities of the region, trusted by the Congress as the highest body of advocate self-government. This system is calibrated. Uh, built on the principle of checks and balances and is absolutely transparent and accountable. Regional conferences and national congress provide an opportunity for a true assessment of the state uh, of affairs in the bar and restuffing body, bodies of bar self-government, actually. Uh, as of lately, more and more younger advocates get elected because it's our policy. We 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 uh, motivate young professionals to be involved in our self-governance, uh, uh, just to be able to teach them to transfer our traditions to younger generation. Uh, new generation is increasingly interested in bar affairs and ready to assume responsibility before thousands of colleagues on a voluntary basis. And that is very important. And actually, for me, it's a great pleasure to, 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 to share this information with you. UNBA established uh, advisory bodies. Uh, it's our blood. It's what we do every day. It's a committees which provide expert and analytical support in key areas of advocacy, in key areas of practicing law, create platform for professional discussion, actively participate in the legislation process, having a constant dialogue with the uh, relevant committees of our parliament. This is very, very important. For the last maybe three years, we, uh, together with the parliament, we actually revised more than uh, 200 uh, drafts of the different laws, different legislation in different areas of our, of our Ukrainian life. So we, we help uh, to make Ukrainian legislation better. We pay our time, we invest our knowledge and our skills, helping our members of the parliament to do their job better. Great, great. And, and I guess as a kind of tail end to that question, uh, has the bar gone through any kind of dispassionate self-analysis and received feedback from its members about perceptions of its governance processes and how they're changing? And, and what would you give our listeners in terms of evidence of that? Yeah, in 2018, um, it was a national survey, and this national survey showed that bar self-government and its decisions enjoy a high level of trust of its uh, constituents. Uh, the national survey showed uh, support for, for the current model of advocacy and high appreciation of the quality of services provided by advocates on the ground and nation nationwide. The um, adaptation of key European standards of the bar independence and self-governance to the national core law has paved the way to, for us um, to integrate into the European professional community, which is very important for us. We deeply value international exchange as, uh, as they provide us with means to improve 
Uh, Ukrainian National Bar Association has started cooperation with uh, uh, many European bars, actually all of them, uh, also uh, United Kingdom Bar Council of, uh, of England and Wales, as well as Law Society of England and Wales, and also many, many other bars uh, around the globe. Uh, Ukrainian National Bar Association is also part of a very important European document. It's a memorandum between European bars under the umbrella of CCBE. It's a European organization which unites all bars of the European Union. And this memorandum name is Memorandum on Mutual Recognition of Lawyers' Cross-Border Continuing Professional Development. This allows Ukrainian advocates to partake in a single European space of professional education formed by the memorandum and covering 45 states of uh, European Union. We also maintain systematic contact with the major international organizations, such as International Bar Association, which currently brings together more than 2,100 2000, uh, associations sorry, uh, of, um, of lawyers from around the world. And thanks to this powerful partnership, we have an opportunity to attract global attention to our problems, if we have problems, or to our success, if we have success. We have success, so it's very important for us to show it, to demonstrate it. We also, um, uh, we also discuss with our international colleagues problems uh, connected with access to justice and other issues uh, in Ukraine. Uh, also, we cooperate with many organizations of lawyers, of jurists, uh, who actually do a lot uh, to protect human rights, professional rights of advocates, etc. It's very important and we, we do a great job in this area, actually, on the international level. Well, thank you so much for that. That, I think, gives us all a sense of, of what uh, the bar is doing to analyze its own progress. And now I'd like to ask just a little bit about uh, the disciplinary process that you outlined before and, and any challenges that you see in implementing that process um, in the environment of change that, that brought about the bar as it exists today. You know, do old habits die hard? How do you um, kind of emphasize transition and transformation during that during that intermediate period. We'd love any comments you have on that. Yeah, of course. Uh, we look at this challenge primarily through the lens uh, of promoting the professional development for our members. We responsibly perceive this mission, invest in the development of the training system and uh, raising standards and uh, expand the choice of areas for professional growth. Taking into account exclusive audience rights, this, is, this strategy is non-alternative. The legal profession involves constant learning process. So raising the professional level is the responsibility of every and each advocate in Ukraine. The Power Council of Ukraine decided to create a single online platform for raising the professional level of advocates, and we even created a special organization, which 100% belongs to the bar. It's UNBA High School for Advocates. Um, this organization uh, do, doing a great job. They, they conduct thousands of events every year, and 80% of those events are free of charge. So our colleagues have great possibility to access the best uh, educational um, products uh, available on the Ukrainian market. Single electronic, electronic resource contains data about all accredi accredited events, which we put on the platform. Advocates may access uh, the online calendar for easy search, the desired event or topic or field of law um, and, and of course as far as it was created uh, for the money of advocates only uh, authenticated advocates has the opportunity to register online for those events and uh, learn from this platform. The bar also has exclusive powers to adopt according to the law to adopt the rules of professional conduct and consider disciplinary complaints against the advocate. So we do it by ourselves. We accept to the profession and we also do disbarment procedures. As the rules of professional con conduct 
approved by the Congress of Advocates. This is the highest body of advocate self-government. And they are mandatory for all advocates in Ukraine. All advocates have to follow those rules. Uh, in drafting the rules, we relied on international standards, of course, best practices, including CCBE Code of Conduct for European law lawyers. And this Code of Conduct, uh, uh, which we have today, is the most modern, most advanced. And uh, we even regulated such sen sensitive and absolutely necessary things like behavior of the lawyers and the social media, internet issues, etc., which is fastly growing, developing, changing. But we actually also change our regulation according to the situation. The legislation also allows an advocate with, uh, it's, it's important to know that our legislation it's not like in the US, to my knowledge, I may be wrong, but in many European countries, if you disbar, you disbar forever. For example, in Germany, that's one lifetime opportunity to be a lawyer, and if you lose it, it's forever. In Ukraine, I, I don't know again if it's good or bad, in Ukraine, the legislation allows an advocate with suspended or terminated right to the practice to appeal this decision actually and after two years after two years again to go through the qualification exam and return to the practice of law but it's very important to know that every advocate can appeal an unfavorable decision uh, for him in a disciplinary cases to our highest qualification disciplinary commission of the bar or alternatively to his choice to the court of law. Um, having those instruments, our law actually gives an advocate the tools to defend uh, their professional own and establish uh, safeguards, prevented disciplinary procedures being used to prosecute advocates for personal reasons or for their professional activities. This is our additional professional guarantees, which is very important to know, and it works perfectly fine. We even have a special committee in National Bar Association, Committee on Protection of Lawyers, because we need it. And uh, every year, we reporting, as I said, we are a very transparent organization on our website. You can find all reports about our activity. Every year we issue the report. And we also issue a report on the problematic issues because those problematic issues help us to get better, to be better, to improve. And one of very important issues which we're dealing with is the protection of our advocates' rights. Because our, if our rights violated, it means that our clients actually rights violated. And it's not about us, it's of course about people, about our clients, about humans whose rights should not be violated by state. And that's why we prepare in those reports and we uh, put we make in public the situation about those violations. We attract as much attention as only possible, not only internally, but also from outside of the Ukraine. And it helps. Transparency helps, helps to improve, helps to control actions, illegal actions from third parties and helps to prevent from doing these violations in the future. Great, great. Well, we actually have a couple of questions from the audience. Before we get there, though, I'm just going to ask one final one. Um, and that's just because I'm intrigued by what seems to be a uniquely Ukrainian experience that you're outlining in the sense that you produce a national bar, as you say, from scratch. And so I'm sure other countries are looking for that kind of progress toward a result like something that you've achieved. And I wonder if you discuss that just a bit before we head into the audience questions. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, actually, you know, cooperation with professional community around the world, abroad, I mean, has not become a one-sided process for us. Uh, we can confidently affirm that Ukrainian National Bar Association has something to share with colleagues from other countries. And we we actually share it right now. We have successfully carried out projects that are of interest to foreign bar associations, and we are ready to share our practical experience of building the bar as institution and share some of our projects as well. In particular, 
uh, our digital products such as Unified Register of Advocates, it's not just a register, it's a very powerful platform which um, can be used not only by advocates, not only by organization, by national bar, but also integrated with other systems like um, online electronic justice platform, for example. It's our unique uh, software which we developed by ourselves and it's great. We also very proud in our electronic ledger of advocates, uh, which this United Register of Advocates actually provides. And uh, um, um, our colleague electronically, digitally can issue electronic warrant this is the, it's like power of the which gives you power to represent people. So we, we should not print it. We just generate it uh, online and it's accepted by courts and by other organizations. We also very proud about our unique software uh, for continuous professional education. Um, education it's a unique system and this is uh, this system uh guaranteed more very very much of interest from uh, our colleagues from other bar association in europe uh and also not only in europe for example our canadian colleagues uh, asked us and french colleagues asked us uh, to promote to, to sell them this software but we are not ready to sell it because it was not developed for sale but we will be happy to share our experience, of course, with them. Um, the, our current law West the Bar Council of Ukraine as the highest body of advocate self-government. Um, and um, according to this status, uh, we have a, a task based on the law to maintain uh, the Unified Register of Advocates of Ukraine. And since 2013, such an electronic register is available at the UNBA website, as I mentioned before. This is an open official database that anyone with interest access can use it. But also our colleagues, as I said, can use internal, huge, uh, amazing possibilities inside the system. Um, as I said, each advocate listed in our register has its own personal online account. And with the help of this service, uh, one has a number of opportunities like warrant generation, as I said, and integration with electronic justice uh, platform. So uh, it's just a short list, but I want to save time and maybe we can go to the questions. Yes, what I'll do is I go right from the feed and just take the questions as they've come in. So the first one is from Dr. Will Pomerantz of the uh, Kennan Institute. He mentions, you discussed the distinct career paths for lawyers in Ukraine. Members of the Advocatura are the most experienced legal practitioners. So do advocates become prosecutors, judges, or pursue government service? Uh, and I think that's the end of the question. So um, any any comments on that? Uh, uh is my understanding correct? The question was about if advocates can become a prosecutor. Am I right or not? Uh, yes, it seems that uh, members of the advocatura are the most experienced legal practitioners. So do advocates become prosecutors, judges, or pursue government service? Yes. Since 2014, when Ukraine had this, you remember, this very important revolution, when we when we got rid finally from Yanukovych, from this pro-Russian president, and when new president uh, Poroshenko was elected, a lot of reforms started, including judicial reform. And during those reforms, members of the advocatura, of the, of the bar, actually became the main source for uh, new uh, judges and for the prosecutor office seats, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we were the source of, uh, of excellent people for, for those organizations because before it was not allowed for advocates to participate in many, many, many uh, positions. But now the situation is uh, completely changed. And uh, for example, our former colleague, Andrei Kostin now is the prosecutor general of Ukraine, but he was a member of Odessa City Bar. He was a deputy deputy head of Odessa Regional Bar Association, actually. So we're very proud that people like him uh, get in these high positions. 
Great, great. Now we have a couple of questions from uh, Rog Candelaria. I'm going to um, propose those questions in the order that they came in. Uh, the first is, uh, in areas controlled by Russia since 2014, are the lawyers, quote, in Russia's pocket, end quote, i.e. pro-Russian? If so, why? And if not, why can't they? What, what, sorry, what can they do for Ukrainian freedom? Um, what are the risks? Uh, if we're talking about territories which are not under Ukrainian control, I cannot comment anything because they have no any information what's really happening in those uh, black uh, black areas. Actually, uh, I think after we will liberate them, then we will see what actually happened there. But now I cannot actually comment that. Uh, for example, all lawyers who were registered on those territories are in our register. So we consider them as our lawyers and we have no right to consider them otherwise. So they, um, they are our colleagues. And then. Um, uh, if uh, a second part of, of your question is uh, uh, what you can do to help uh, to build better Ukrainian freedom, as I understood, if I, if I understood correctly. But I think that international legal community now can support Ukraine in general. Please talk with your clients. Please talk with politicians. Please convince them to support Ukraine because Ukraine now fighting for for better, for democracy, actually, for, for the values we share. And we... Today, we in the front line of this fight, which actually world had with a very bad evil from Russia. So I think that every person can contribute even by normal conversation, even just by talking with your friends, just to support what Ukraine do protecting us. We, we can protect ourselves, but we need support of international community all kinds of support, not only financial, military, but also emotional support. It's also very important for us because now we are the victims and we are fighting. So we need this support. We actually have a question from an anonymous attendee and they ask, can you please talk about the ways the Ukrainian bar tackles corruption within the Ukrainian court system and specifically among judges? Um, are there legal mechanisms in place that oversee the judges? Uh, that's actually a great question, and I'm really happy to answer this question. Um, you know, uh, maybe, George, you remember we already discussed this once, that Ukraine used to, used to be um, on a, or in informational, in information uh, space, like country with the highest level of corruption, etc. But it's not the case anymore. For, for already for since 2015, Ukraine launched and it proved to be very successful, super powerful and very interesting anti-corruption compliance system, which which does not exist in any other country of the world, and we needed this. A tough system and it proved its effectiveness as I said because we already have statistics how many judges already went to the jail for taking bribes but it's not the case it's, it's not massive at all now it's completely different because judicial reform started in 2014 and still can, uh, it was on pause for, for a while for different political reasons because of change of political elites. But now uh, Ukrainian society has huge demand for, for the finalization of this judicial reform. And just two weeks ago, we actually elected Supreme Council of Justice. These are the official body in the system of the courts who is responsible for disciplinary procedures against judges, which is very important to make them accountable, you know, for all their wrongdoings. And I cannot say that we have this massive problem with that now. No, not at all. Uh, we made a huge progress fighting corruption with all these anti-corruption compliance institutions, not only judges, but also oligarchs, members of the parliament, ministers, uh, representative of the governments, just go to jail for corruption. So this is very important. This, that is what actually Ukrainian people wanted, and that's what 
international society wanted from Ukraine helping Ukraine. So I'm I, I'm happy to I'm happy to say that we have a huge progress here, and it was even acknowledged by Ursula von der Leyen, the president of European Commission, in her speech when it was. Um, uh, that when European Union adopted the decision uh, to grant us a candidacy status, uh, because without this progress, even having the war in Ukraine, it would never be reality. But it's but we did it, and we of course we we have a lot to do in the future. But we work hard and quite successful. Thank you. So we have a little bit of overlap over some questions. So I apologize if I um, kind of think we've we've covered the topic you're raising, but we have a great question from David Eggleston, um, which is: Can you can the Ukrainian Bar Association uh, seek the disbarment of prosecutors for misconduct, and does this create a conflict with the Ukrainian government? Um, if prosecutor um, uh, behave. Um, in, in any way somehow wrong. Uh, we have very effective mechanism in place. Uh, there is a disciplinary commission against prosecutors. And it's interesting fact that National Bar Association appoint one representative into this commission actually. So we involved directly in the process of disciplinary uh, proceedings against prosecutors. Uh, and it works very well. So it's also new. We we didn't have it before 2012, 2014, but now it works like this, and we're happy. Uh, actually, our new prosecutor general now is very tough, and uh, I think that um, we will see more and more progress in the area of, prosecu of pro 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 prosecutor office in Ukraine. They're doing a great job on international level now. They responsible for collecting of evidences of war. They now communicated on the daily basis with the International Criminal Court, etc., other institutions like this. So I think everything will be even better. Great. We have another question from Rog Candelaria. Uh, what perhaps are the subtle differences between the terms advocate and lawyer in the Ukrainian context? Do advocates only uh, uh, do advocates and only advocates draft contracts, wills, trusts, etc.? No. Uh, the difference is very easy to explain. A lawyer is a person with a diploma from the university that he has degree, law degree. He is a lawyer. But he never can practice law. He never can use it. He became a lawyer when he granted this diploma of law degree. After that, you have to choose in Ukraine which profession you want to do. You want to be in-house lawyer? Please. No procedures, no special procedure. You just go to the company and you work exclusively inside of the company uh, as uh, in-house lawyer. You can consult only this particular company which you work for. If you want to become an advocate, you need to pass through the bar exam. When you pass the bar exam, then you became an advocate we put you into the register of advocates and you granted a lot of special um, rights and obligations according to the law about bar and practice of law. And advocates in Ukraine provide all, all types of legal uh, support, including consulting, representation to the court, criminal courts, commercial courts, everything. No, no limitation. So this is legal profession, actually. Advocates represent legal profession, actually. But if a person who graduated from the university also wants to go to the prosecution office, they just go there, and it's the easiest way to become a prosecutor, go through some commission in the prosecutor office, and they just can accept them. But it's not exception to the bar as in the US, as I said in my speech. It's completely different. If a person wants to be a judge, 
it's very complicated process. They need to go through the special procedures, special exams, special selection process because they need to prove that they um, uh, have have no problems with their reputation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. By the way, in Ukraine, we don't have elected judges. All judges go through the similar procedure, and uh, in the end of the day, they are appointed. Uh, ceremony uh, it's a ceremony by signature of the president but president has no influence on this process actually it's a specially designed uh, independent process of selection actually in um, in uh, in this process um, only judges mostly participate so existing judges actually accept new judges and also um, it's a very interesting process, as I said, but it's quite complicated. So the difference between lawyer and advocates, we are members of the bar and they are just people with a legal education. Very good. Um, I want to jump to a question that's uh, kind of responding to some of the headlines that have been coming out. It comes from Bruce Marks. He says, quote, I have been involved in representing Ukrainian clients since 2003. The media reports that several high-ranking officials have been dismissed by Zelensky for corruption. At the same time, it does not appear Ukraine has recovered monies allegedly stolen by Yanukovych. What is the prognosis? Uh, That's true. Just a few days ago, we we saw major, major dismissal process in the in our current government and uh, political party led by Zelensky, actually. It, that is a result, a result, as I said, of complete intolerance to the corruption. If something just happened, we should not prove it. If, if the person just decided to go to Thailand, like today one MP who is have to be in the parliament, but now he's in Thailand having fun, he just resigned. That's what really happened in Ukraine. We could not imagine such development a few years ago. No. And uh, if we're talking about money which we need to, let's say, collect money were stolen from Ukrainians, that's true, by people like Yanukovych, uh, because we are lawyers, we have to be very precise. Um, This job actually uh, on its way, and as far as I know, again, our prosecutor, prosecution office, work on these issues. It's not the issue of the bar. So I cannot, I don't know details, I cannot comment. But what I really need to say is that our country now work hard with our international partners to improve uh, cooperation in the legal area to make easier cooperation in the questions like this because before we have difficulties with the acknowledgement of our court uh, rulings if even even if we have a ruling of the court in the favor of someone in ukraine we cannot enforce it in us that's for sure so and in many european countries you need to go to their local court to acknowledge decision ruling of the Ukrainian courts and vice versa. It's very complicated, but now we work how to make it simpler, how to make it faster, and how to to, pu- to, to push it. Everything developing, everything get better. Thank you. I think uh, we have time for a few more questions. So what I'm going to do is put two questions together, uh, one from Joe Burns and one from Michelle Kundmuller. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, we'll, we'll start with Joe's question. Uh, he says, like so many Americans, I've been inspired by the courage um, of the Ukrainian people and President Zelensky over the past year. What can we do as American lawyers and members of the Federalist Society to help you, your organization and the Ukrainian people? And Michelle asks a similar question. Are there good ways for Americans, att- American attorneys, especially those without co- uh, government connections, to put their skills at the service of Ukraine's independence? Can we support your bar in supporting your nation's democracy? Our skill set doesn't transfer the same way that, say, a doctor's does. So is there ways, uh, is there something particularly useful that members of the U.S. bar can do to help? Uh, it's very broad qu- question, and I would it, it can it, it can take maybe half an hour uh, answering this because we need so many things but I would focus on on very specific uh, recently uh, 
maybe maybe four months ago, I met president of American Bar Association in Miami on the IBA conference. And I discussed with her um, a few very important things for us. Uh, I think that Ukrainian advocates, Ukrainian legal society in general, not only advocates, but members of our offices who are not advocates, but legal staff, our colleagues, members of their families. What we really need now is um, some program uh, led by international uh, professionals about mental health. Because now uh, it's very, very difficult for us to live here and to to resist this continuous, non-stop stress and pressure which we have because of the war. This is physical demand. We need it. And we don't need doctors. We need mm -hmm. professionals who can help us in a professional way to understand better how we need to behave, how we need to work, how we can combine war with the practice of law, because we never stopped practicing law during the war, actually. We always been provided our constitutional obligation. We provided protection to everyone who needed it. In every region, we provided legal aid. We provided defense to the prisoners of war, by the way, because Ukraine is a country with a rule of law. So we provide defense to every person who needed it. Of course, it was not supported by society. Uh, people said, okay, how these lawyers can protect Russians? Russians are killing our people and they uh, defend those Russians. We are not defending their crimes. We just defending their human rights. Every human being has rights and they have rights too. Because if we would not provide them uh, legal representations in the court of law. In the future, they can claim that their rights were violated and they were illegally actually put into the jail or something like this. So we need to observe human rights in Ukraine even during the war and we do these things. But we need some training or some program which will teach us how to react, how to reflect how to communicate, how to live in peace with yourself and with all this pressure as a professional, not as a human being. We are human beings still, but... And another issue, as I already said, mm, so think about that. If you have good recommendations, or maybe you can gather some group of people who can help with that, we will be very grateful we can do it on the national level. It's very easy. But another thing, it, Maybe if, if you work in the field of international law, if you have any ideas how to help Ukraine as a state, it's not to the Ukrainian National Bar Association, because our obligation is to provide uh, legal support. That's our constitutional aim. And the aim of the prosecutor is to collect evidences of crime, go to the court, accuse people into the, uh, and that, that's their role. Our role is to protect, to defend. And the role of the state is to create this atmosphere, this mechanism uh, to, to put all these, um, let's say, procedures together. What I mean, our state now looking for the best legal solution for future, let's say, tribunal, I don't know, court, let's call it whatever you call it. But what we really need, we need to make those who did those atrocities accountable in the future. Yes. And second, we need to know and we need to find the mechanism how we can um, compensate all this huge damage, commercial damage, which we suffer. A lot of international companies, a lot of people just suffered, lost their property. We don't, we don't have now effective legal mechanism which will provide us the result, the real result. So brilliant legal minds, if you have great ideas, you are very welcome. I will be really happy 
to be in contact with you. Please connect me directly in LinkedIn. If you have any ideas, it would be great. I can connect you with the right people and I can recommend you to participate in specific working group, et cetera, et cetera. That's the practical, uh, actually, help which you can provide. Well, that brings us right up to the hour. Uh, Valentin, I have to thank you again uh, for joining us from Kiev during this very difficult time. I really hope that you stay safe during uh, bombing episodes like yesterday evening and taking so much time out of your schedule is such a is such an honor for us um, and arranging all the backup batteries and things you need to, to do this kind of Zoom conversation. We really appreciate that. I'd also like to thank the Federalist Society and the International and National Security Law Practice Group for making this happen. Uh, we, we are particularly indebted to the support of Matthew Hyman and Jack Capizzi. Uh, with that, I think I'll bring the event to a conclusion and, and just thank all of our participants. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you all for attending today. Uh, we always welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. Uh, please keep an eye on your emails and our website for further announcements. Um, and apart from that, thank you all for your time. We are adjourned.